One. Story of the door. Mr. Otterson, the lawyer, was a man of rugged countenance that was never lighted by a smile, cold, scant, and embarrassed in discourse, backward in sentiment, lean, long, dusty, dreary, and somehow lovable. At friendly meetings, when wine was to his taste, something eminently human beacon from his eye, something indeed, which never found its way into his talk. But which spoke not only in those silent symbols of after-dinner phase, but more often and loudly in the, in the acts of his life. He was austere with himself, drank gin when he was alone, and to mortify a taste for vintages. And though he enjoyed the theater, had not crossed the doors for one for 20 years. But he had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering almost with envy at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds. And in any extremity inclined to help rather than to reprove. I inclined to a Cain's heresy, he used to say quaintly. I let my brother go to the devil in his own way. In this character, it was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of the downgoing men. And to those such as these, So long as they came about his chambers, he never remarked a shade of change in his demeanor. No doubt the feat was easy to Mr. Otterson, for he was undemonstrative at best. And even his friendship seemed to be founded in a single catholicity. Of good nature. It is the mark of an honest, a modest man to accept his friendly circle ready-made from the hands of opportunity. And that was the lawyer's way. His friends were those of his own blood or those whom he had known the longest. His affections, like Avi, were the growth of time. They implied no aptness as in, the, in the object. Hence, no doubt, the bond that united him to Mr. Richard Enfield his distant kinsman, the well-known man about town. It was a nut to crack for many what these two could see in each other or what subject they could find in common. It was reported by those who encountered their, them in their Sunday walks that they said nothing, looked singularly dull, and would hail with obvious relief the appearance of a friend. For all that, the two men put the greatest store by these excursions, counted them the chief jewel each week, and not only set aside occasions of pleasure, but even resisted the cause of business, that they might enjoy them uninterrupted. <clears throat> uninterrupted. It chanced in one of these rambles that they led their way down the by street of the busy quarter of London, the street was small and what is called quiet, but it drove a thriving trade on the weekdays. The inhabitants were all doing well, it seemed, and all amulets to leave hoping to do is better still, and laying out the surplus of their gains in coquetry, so that the shop front stood along that thoroughfare with an air of invitation, like rows of smiling saleswomen. Even on Sunday, when it was, when it veiled its more florid charms and lay comparatively empty of passage, the street shone out in contrast to its dingy neighborhood. 
like a fire in a forest. And with its freshly painted shutters, well-polished brasses, and general cleanliness and gaiety of note, instantly caught and pleased the eye of the passenger. Two doors from one corner. On the left hand, going east, the line was broken by the entry of a cord, and just at that point, a certain sinister block of building thrust forward its cable in the street. It was two stories high, showed no window, nothing but a door on the lower side story and a blind forehead with discolored wall in the upper and bore in every feature the marks of prolonged or sordid negligence. The door, which was equipped with neither bell nor knocker, was blistered and disdained. Tramps slouched in the recess and struck matches on the panels. Children kept shop up upon the steps schoolboy had tried his knife on the moldings, and for clothes on a generation no one had appeared to drive away these random visitors or to repair their ravages. Mr. Enfield and the lawyer were on the other side of the by street, but when they came abreast of the entry, the former lifted his, up his cane and pointed. Did you ever remark that door? He asked when his companion would, had replied in the affirmative. It is connected with my mind, he had, added he, with a very odd story. Indeed, said Mr. Utterson with a slight change of voice. And what was that? Well, it was this way, returned Mr. Enfield. I was coming home from some place in the end of the world about three o'clock of a black winter morning. In my way, lay through a part of town where there was literally nothing to be seen. lamps. Street after street and all the folk asleep, street after street all lighted up as if for a pro procession and all empty as church. Till at last I got into that state of mind where men listens and listens and begins to long for the sight of a policeman. All at once I saw two figures, one a little man who was stumping along east of word at a good walk, and the other a girl of maybe eight or ten, who was running as hard as she was able to down a cross street. Well, sir. The two ran into another one another, naturally enough at the corner. And then came the horrible part of the thing. For the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounded nothing to hear, but it was hellish to see. It wasn't like a man. It was like some damned juggernaut. I give a view hello, tucked my heels, collared my gentleman, and brought him back to where there was already a quiet group about the screaming child. He was perfectly cool and made no resistance, but gave me one look. So ugly that it brought out the sweat only like running. The people who had turned out were the girl's own family, and pretty soon, the doctor from whom she had been sent put in his appearance. Well, the child was not much the worse, more frightened according to the sawbones. And there you might have supposed might be an end to it, but there was one curious circumstance. I had taken no loathing to my gentleman at first sight. So had the child's family, which was only natural. But the doctor's case was what struck me. He was the usual cut and dry apothecary of no particular age and color, with a strong Edinburgh accent. And about all his emotion was a bagpipe. Well, sir, he saw 
He was like the rest of us. Each time, every time he looked at my prisoner, I saw that Sawbones turned sick and white with the desire to kill him. I knew what was in his mind, just as he knew what was in mine. And killing being out of the question, we did the next best. We told the man who we, could, we could and would make a scandal out of this. That should make his name stink from one end of London to the other. And if he had any friends or any credit, we undertook that he should lose them. And all the time we were pitching it in red hot. We were keeping the women off him as best we could. For they were like wild, wild as harpies. I never saw a circle of such hateful faces. And there was a man in the middle with a kind of black, sneering coolness. Frightened, too. I could see that, but carrying off it like Sir... Really, like Satan. If you choose to make capital out of this accident, said he, I am naturally helpless. No gentleman but wishes to avoid a scene, says he. Name your figure. Well, we screwed him up to about 100 pounds for the fam child's family. He would have clearly liked to stick out, but there was something about that a lot of us meant mischief. And at last he struck. The next thing was to get the money. And where do you think he carried us but to that place with the door? Whipped out a key, went in, and presently came back with a matter of ten pounds in gold and a check for the balance on coots. Drawn payable to bearer and sign with a name that I can't mention, though it is one of the points of my story, but it was a name at least very well known and often printed. The figure was stiff, but the signature was good more, or more than that. It was if it was only genuine. Genuine. I took the liberty of pointing out to my gentleman that the whole business looked apocryphal. That a man does not, in real life, walk into a cellar door at four in the morning and come out of it with another man's check for close upon a hundred pounds. But he was quite easy and sneering. Set your mind to rest, he says he. I will stay with you till the banks open and cast the check myself. So we all set off, the doctor and the child's father, and the friend and myself, and passed the rest of the night in my chambers. And the next day... When we had breakfast, went to a body to the bank. I gave the check to myself. And he said that every reason I shouldn't believe it was a forgery, not a bit of it. The check was genuine. Tut tut, said Mr. Sutterson. I see you feel as I do, said Mr. Enfield. Yes, it's a bad story, for my man was a fellow that nobody could have to do with it. A really damnable man. And the person who drew the check was the very pink of the proprieties. Celebrate, too, and what makes it worse? One of your fellows who do what they call good. Black man, I suppose. An honest man paying through the nose from some of the capers of his youth. Black male house is what they used, what I call that place with the door. In consequence, though even that you know is far from explaining all, he added with words fell into a vein of musing. From this he recalled my Mister Otterson asking rather suddenly, "And you don't know who the drawer of the check lives there?" A likely place, isn't it? Returned Mr. Enfield. But I happen to have it noticed his address. He lives in some square or other. And you never asked about the, the place with the door? Said Mr. Augustine. No, sir, I had a delicacy, was his reply. I feel very strongly about putting questions. It partakes too much of the style of the day of judgment. You start a question, and starting like a stone, you sit quietly on top of the hill. And away the stone goes, starting others. 
and presently some bland old bird, the last you would have thought of, is knocked on the head in his own back garden, and the family have, have to change their name. No, sir, I make a rule of mine. It's more, the more it looks like Queer Street, the less I ask. A very good rule, too, said the lawyer. But I have studied the place more for myself, continued Mr. Unabuild. It scarcely seems like a house. There is no other door. And nobody goes in or out of that one, but once in a great while, the gentleman of my adventure. There are three windows looking out of the court of the first floor, none below. The windows are always shut, but they're clean. And then there is a chimney, which is generally smoking, so somebody must live there. And yet, it's not so sure, for the buildings are so packed together by that court that it's hard to say where one ends and the other begins. The pair walked on again for some a while of silence. And then... Enfield, said Mr. Utterson, that's a good rule of yours. Yes, I think it is, returned Enfield. But for all that, continued the lawyer, there's one point I want to ask. I want to ask the name of that man who walked over the child. Well, to Mr. Enfield, I can't see what harm I would do. It was the name of a man of the name of Hyde. Hmm, said Mr. Robertson. What sort of man is he to, to see? He's not easy to describe. There's something wrong with his appearance, something displeasing, something downright detestable. I never saw a man I so disliked, and yet I scarcely know why. He must be deformed somewhere, but he gives a strong feeling of deformity. Although I couldn't specify the point, he's an extraordinary looking man, and yet I really can name nothing out of the way. <sighs> no, sir, I can make no hand of it. I can't describe him, and it is not for one of memory. For I can declare I can see him at this moment. Mr. Utterson again walks some way in silence, and obviously under a weighty consideration. You are sure he used the key? He inquired at last. My dear sir, began Enfield, surprised out of himself. Yes, I know, said Utterson. It must seem strange. The fact is, if I did not ask you the name of the other party, it is because I already know it. I know it already. You see, Richard, your tale has gone home. If you have been inexact at any point, you had better correct it. I think you might have warned me, returned the other with a touch of solemnness. But I have been pandemically correct, as you call it. The fellow had it, he, and what's more, he has it still. I saw him used it not a week ago. Mr. Utterson sighed deeply, but never said a word, and the young man presently resumed. Here's another lesson to say nothing, said he. I'm ashamed of my long tongue. Let us make a bargain never to refer to this again. With all my heart, said the lawyer, I shake hands on that, Mr. Richard. <laughs>